Okay. Expositor's Bible Commentary has a summary of 1 Corinthians 14. At this point, a summary of 1 Corinthians 14, of the place of speaking in tongues in the apostolic community of the 1st century A.D., and also a discussion of tongues in the post-apostolic period, and the relevance of tongues in the 20th century church, is in order. First, in Paul's discussion of this and other gifts, in chapters 12 to 14, he emphasizes priority of love over tongues and the other gifts. 1 Corinthians 13. Second, in the list of offices, those of apostles, prophets, and teachers in the gifts of the church, 1227-31a, the office gifts are listed first, with other gifts following, the last being tongues. It's not that important especially for the congregation. This implies that Paul gives priority to office gifts over tongues. Furthermore, among the office gifts, that of apostles who were unique in having seen the Lord ceased to exist in the first century A.D. We well, can see that because the way the, the uh, first century congregation church's meetings were uh, held, it wasn't a structured thing like we have today. It was up to the Holy Spirit to direct each individual to... Uh, uh, express himself in the spiritual gift that he had, a gift to gifts, and so on. So, the apostles in the first century ceased to, they've done their function, and now we've gone into the the, uh, the rest of the church age. Sad to say, it hasn't been very, very uh, commensurate with the uh, goal which would uh, Paul has set for the church to do because of the willfulness of the church age believers. Third, in his treatment of tongues and prophecy in chapter 14, Paul again shows his preference for prophecy over tongues. Some of the former was the gift that brought edification to the church. He minimizes the importance of the gift of tongues when he says in the church, I would rather speak five intelligent words to instruct others than ten thousands of words in a tongue. Fourth, in the discussion in chapter 12 regarding the diversity of gifts and their functions in the church, the body of Christ, Paul uses the analogy of the human body with its various parts functioning in unique and distinct ways without each one trying to usurp the function of another part. So he shows that the gifts, including tongues, were not to be sought for the, the sake of the gifts, nor was everyone to seek to have the same gift such as tongues. Everybody wanted to be in the glory uh, area. But the office gifts, the gifts of helps, far more important. The unseen, less dramatic gifts, far more important. Fifth, God does not have to work by miraculous means to accomplish his purposes. He uses, usually uses our ordinary natural means, such as in the production of crops. He uses the sun, the rain, and the nutrients of the ground as well as the hard work of men in farming the land. In conjunction and connection with charismata, the Greek word from which we get the current form charismatic, which is translated spiritual gifts, it is significant that in 1 Corinthians 12, 5 to 11, not all of the charismata mentioned are miraculous, as e.g. the gifts of wisdom and knowledge, which are mentioned before the miraculous ones, including tongues. It is not essential that everyone have a miraculous gift, where Paul uses rhetorical questions to show not all Christians had or were to have one particular gift in common. The questions in the Greek sentences that comprise 12, 29, and 30 begin with the negative, me, the, the, the Greek word me meaning negative, which expects a negative response. 
Six, on the basis of the phenomena of foreign languages spoken of in Acts 2, 5 to 12, we have argued that the tongues referred to in 1 Corinthians 14, 13, and 15, 20 and 25 were also foreign language tongues, not ecstatic utterances, gibberish, or non-understandable erratic variations of consonants, consonants and vowels with indiscriminate modulation of pitch, speed, volume, and so on, which really produces a nonsensical language. Seventh, the essential offices for building up the body of Christ, the church, are according to Paul, those of apostles, prophets, evangelists, and pastor teachers. The one Greek article unites the United the pastor teacher gift and office. He says nothing there about the necessity of miraculous gifts, either in evangelism or in the teaching and edifying ministry of the church. Eighth, the other New Testament passages in which Christian worship patterns are set do not include, or as in the exceptional case of the Corinthian church, do not emphasize miraculous gifts and functions. This is true not only for worship in the developing church under Paul's ministry, as portrayed in the last half of Acts and in the epistles, but also on the worship of the Old Testament and early New Testament periods involving predominantly Jewish Christians, worship patterns taken over largely by the developing Jewish Gentile church. This important, these important elements of worship were the reading of Scripture and expounding it with understanding, and other sermons and <coughs> prayer, singing, Christian koinomy or fellowship, Christian ceremonies or sacraments as the Passover and the Lord's Supper, and fasting. Miraculous gifts, including tongues, are, apart from the unique situation at Corinth, absent from these contexts, <coughs> the conclusion being that they were not to be a necessary part of the general worship patterns of the church. Ninth, miraculous activity, including speaking in a, in a tongue, did not did come in biblical times from other sources than the Lord. Witness such activity induced by evil spirits and satanic forces. The Gerasenemy de demon-possessed man, the uh, spirit-possessed girl, the image of the evil beast that is given the power to speak by the other satanic beast. <clears throat> Psychological factors were involved in the superhuman strength and tongue-speaking activity of the Gerasenemy Demon possessed man, for upon his deliverance from the demons, he was found to be in his right mind. There are, therefore, caution and balance are needed in relation to such miraculous activities as speaking in tongues. Yes, people can say, well, I could do those miraculous gifts that kind of verifies that I'm saved. <clears throat> but I don't need the gift of tongues to know that I'm saved. I use scripture. Having pointed this out, we must also recognize that the Bible shows that other gifts were also perverted by Satan. The Old Testament speaks more than once of false prophets as does the New Testament. The Bible speaks of false professors, false pastors, worthless shepherds, hirelings, and frequently warns against false teachers. Yet no one would insist that either prophecy in its valid sense of speaking out for God to the people or the pastoral teaching ministry is no longer valid. Misuse of a gift does not invalidate the gift itself. However, because of their ultimate psychological nature, tongues must be viewed with special caution and not be overstressed. Tenth, it is to be noted that directly after the first century AD apostolic period, legitimate miraculous gifts such as tongues practically ceased. According to Warfield, there is little or no evidence at all for miracle working during the first 50 years of the post-apostolic church. It is slight and unimportant for the next 50 years. It grows much more abundant during the first century, the third, and it becomes abundant and precise only in the fourth century to increase still further in the fifth and beyond. Miracles yesterday and today in, in Erdman's publishing. In discussing the witness of the apostolic fathers, the early church writers of the late first century AD and the first century of the first half of the second century, Warfield goes on to say the writings of the so-called apostolic fathers contain no clear and certain allusions to miracle working or to the exercise of the charismatic gifts contemporaneous uh, with themselves. In the first place, in the place of these authentic apostolic miraculous gifts, including tongues, 
there arose in later centuries reports of many preposterous miracles. One such story is told in Los Evangelios Apophisario. Um, according to the story, the infant Jesus on the trip to Egypt caused a palm tree to bow down so that a coconut might be picked for his mother. The, such so-called miracles occur in the writings of the New Testament Apocrypha, both in the Apocryphal Gospels and the Apocryphal Apost Apostolic and Early Church writings, which are not scripture. New Testament Apocrypha. The questions to be asked are these. Why did the authentic miraculous gifts cease? Of course, we have that in 1 Corinthians 13. Their purposes were fulfilled. The more perfect, neuter gender came. New Testament. Are such miraculous gifts to be sought today? The first question leads us to ask, why there was a preponderance of miraculous gifts, including tongues, at the time of the ministries of Jesus Christ and his apostles. Certainly, miraculous gifts do not appear as a part of God's working among the believers in all parts of the biblical record. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the twelve patriarchs did not possess or use miraculous gifts, apart from receiving the word of God in visions and dreams in a day when the scriptures were being given. The same is true of David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and others. However, when certain prophets of God needed particular support and verification, authentic, authentication, then God performed great miracles through them, as with Moses and Joshua, and Elijah and Elisha. Likewise, in the time of Jesus' ministry, and that of the apostles, God verified, first century, that the message and the work of Jesus and the apostles, who had witnessed to God's work in Jesus' life, death, and for resurrection by performing mighty miracles through the apostles, including speaking in tongues, then miracles ceased. Because we have the New Testament. They testified to all these miraculous things. Well, who are you? Well, here's a miracle. Oh, okay, now you're believable. But now the New Testament came out, and it's a God-inspired book. Just open up your Bible, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the epistles. Then miracles ceased when the need for the particular witness was ended, and the writing of the scriptures was complete. Thus, Warfield argues when, in speaking about the charismatic gifts, he says, it is required of all of them, the gifts such as tongues, that they be exercised for the edification of the church, and a distinction is drawn between them and in value, in proportion as they were for edification. But the immediate end <coughs> for which they were given is not left doubtful, and that proves to be not directly the extension of the church, but the authentication of of the apostles as messengers from God, and also the citizens there in the first century who believers, because the, the New Testament epistles were not out there, nor the Gospels. This does not mean, of course, that only the apostles appear in the New Testament as working miracles, or that they alone are represented <coughs> as rep recipients of the charismata, but it does mean that the charismata belonged in a true sense to the apostles and constituted one of the signs of an apostle. Now, as to the relevance of tongue speaking in the church today, we may observe, in addition to the foregoing discussion first, that the requirements that Paul gives for the important offices of elder and deacon say nothing about the necessity that the bearers of these offices have such gifts. <clears throat> Second, the instructions in given Christians as to how they are to live together in the various units of society <clears throat> say nothing about the exercise of these kinds of gifts. In conclusion, the writer believes that the best answer to the question of the relevance of the gifts of tongues today is found in the principle that God used this and other miraculous gifts in Old Testament and Apostolic times to authenticate the messengers of his word and that the present-day Christian is not to seek such gifts. This is not to say, however, that the churches collectively and individually should not pray that if it is God will, the sick may be healed by his power or that the church should not pray for a deeper illumination in understanding God's inerrant written word. Having said this, the writer realizes that there are many Christians of Orthodox evangelical commitment who hold that the gift of tongues is set forth in Acts and 1 Corinthians 12 to 14 is relevant today, but it's not because <clears throat> impending judgment AD 70. Some of them would no doubt recognize that speaking in tongues is the least of the gifts as suggested in 1 Corinthians 12, 28 to 30, where Paul placed it last in the list of those gifts, where he subordinates it to prophecy. But they would insist that the gift is not completely ruled out for this modern era, says, since Paul declares, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Moreover, since Christians who accept the, the present validity of tongues would doubtless say that the contemporary